The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, good afternoon or oh, good morning. We're still in the morning. Um, I was up bright and early today doing my exercise, enjoying this fabulous weather that we have. So wherever you are joining us uh, across Australia, thank you very much, and I hope that you've had a great start to the day. I'd like to welcome Sonia uh, Vandenbosch, who is our founder and MD of Twin Life. Welcome, Sonia, and thank you for joining us today. The, today's workshop is all about digital and social, and it's the second workshop in a series of three workshops uh, that Sonia has kindly offered to um, deliver um, for members. Uh, she's doing this out of the kindness of her heart. She's doing it for free, and um, we're very lucky to have her expertise. If you missed the fir first workshop, which was all about strategy, definitely jump across to the AFTER website because we have the recording up there uh, so you can catch up. And I know that Sonia may refer to some of the context uh, from last week but um, definitely do that. If you look at your toolbar today, you'll notice firstly that you're all in listen only mode. You'll also notice that there's a question toolbox. So if you've got any questions, please feel free to use that, write the questions, and then we'll allocate some time, if we have any, uh, at the end to answer those. You'll also notice a section in the toolbox which says handouts. I have placed in there two handouts. Firstly, a handout from last week, and then secondly, a handout that Sonia is going to get you to use today. They're both labelled differently. One from last week is labelled strategy and the one from this week is labelled digital. So please definitely download that. Also on the line with us today, we've got AFTER Head of Education and Training and you will have seen Mel's face just pop up. And uh, Mel, just in the nick of time, because I might uh, hand over to you to um, say a few words about Sonia, uh, because I know that you have, um, your history with her goes back a long way, and you're actually the one that uh, recruited Sonia to do today's webinar for us. Thanks, Jo, and thanks, Sonia, very much for um, agreeing to help um, AFTER and its members to um, reboot and, and help help our members recover um, this whole COVID-19 period. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about Sonia. She's originally from the Netherlands and she now lives in Sydney. Um, Sonia's an avid world traveller who has worked in business and marketing leadership roles in Europe, North America, Asia and Australia in a wide variety of industries, including travel. Um, Sonia currently leads a highly successful strategic leadership and marketing business called Twin Life Marketing that she founded in 2009. Sonia was the forefront of the digital marketing revolution in the travel industry, being one of the first marketing leaders who implemented a digital strategy for a specialised tour operating company and helped them globally expand. Since then, Sonia has helped many companies embrace the digital opportunities and integrate them into their business strategy and marketing programs. So that's a bit about Sonia's background. I met Sonia when I was working in my prior position at Family Business Australia which is the industry association for all family businesses across Australia, which is 75% of all companies. And she is a, a strategic consultant with Family Business Australia. And while she does, a lot of her clients are medium to large businesses. She also specialises and has a very strong understanding of SMEs and particularly family owned businesses. And many of our members are family owned businesses. So I'm really looking forward to today's webinar to hear what Sonia's got to say and how she can help everybody. Thanks, Sonia. Thank you. Let's get started. I'm excited to be here again. And thank you for everyone who tuned in last week. And I hope you've been able to uh, use your worksheet and find some hidden opportunities already. Before I go into it, I just want to say a really big thank you to Katty Burnett Cosgrove. Um, I know that you're on the webinar today. First of all, thank you for sending me such a heartfelt email. And um, it didn't only do me good that you experienced the webinar last week as an unexpected gift, but I just wanted to point out that you really nailed it when you said travel in itself is all about perception. And that is why maintaining focus is so important to both those creating the dream and the travelers yet to experience the dream. I just really wanted to, to start with that to kick off uh, this webinar. 
Thank you so much for sharing, Cathy. And the other thing I wanted to say, I love your email signature. Email signature is, in my opinion, an undervalued digital marketing tool that is free. Just think about how many emails you send uh, every day. And it's a really great way to actually get your marketing message across. So as Melinda said, I am indeed originally from the Netherlands. And while I was preparing for this webinar, I was actually reflecting back on my childhood. And as we were living, obviously, in Northern Europe, we, we always would go on holidays in Southern Europe to chase the sun. And I remember the days when the travel brochures would come out at the travel agent and my dad and I would race to the travel agent. And we would spend nights pouring over the guides and making notes and selecting our next holiday. Um, now fast forward to 2015, and when, my, when I had children myself and my twin boys, they were eight years old at the time, were really into Lego, they loved it. And one of my boys um, put it in his head and was very convinced that he was gonna become a Lego designer. So one day he comes to me and he says, mom, I want to go to Billund in Denmark. I've researched everything on the internet. That's where Lego is from. That's where the Lego house is. I want to go to the Lego house. I've already researched that we can drive from the Netherlands to there. So what do you think? And yes, obviously we did that. So the reason why I'm telling you this story is that the core of the story of, you know, searching for travel experiences and dreaming is exactly the same. The channels are just very different. So that's what we're talking about today, obviously, about the digital world. So last week, I told you about how I, as a student, organized trips to Russia with a travel agent. And today, I'd like to talk to you about a digital story. So in 2001, um, my husband and I, we left the Netherlands. We sold our house, sold everything we had, gave up our jobs because we wanted to travel the world. Just before we left, the new, the first ever um, digital camera was released. And my husband is quite technically savvy and into all this stuff. And he said, we have to buy this. And then he said, you know what we also can do? Why don't we build a website? And I take the photos, you write the stories. And then at the end of our journey, we kind of have a travel journey. And what we can also do in the meantime is we can give this website address, this URL, to our friends and to our families, and they can follow us. So we built a website. It was a lot of coding and very clunky at the time. And we had something very cool at the time. We had a worldwide membership so that we could dial in from every country to a local number so that we could upload our information. This meant that every two weeks we had to upgrade from you know, our backpack accommodation to a more decent hotel so that we had access to a telephone line. And I remember the discussions we had before we went on this world trip. Are we going to do this? Are we not going to do this? If we're going to do this, does this mean that we are not 100% present in the travel experience? But the upside is, if we do it, we have this great memory afterwards, and it will be a really great way to stay in contact with friends and family. So yes, we decided to do it. What actually happened was, if we didn't upload our information within two or three weeks, we had people starting to complain. We were getting emails, where is your next part of your story? And remember, this was before the time of Facebook, this was before the times of blogs, and what was really interesting was that those emails didn't even come from our family or our friends. They came from people we didn't even know. So this website had gone viral, had gone to friends of family and family of family and has gone further and further. So I'm telling you this story because that is the power of digital. It's the power of amplifying something. And when I worked for Travel Indo China, I indeed used a digital strategy to expand globally. And I'll tell you about that a bit later um, in this webinar. And then obviously nowadays, I am an advisory board member with Luxperia based in Vietnam. And we use technology because we can't see each other at the moment. So we do everything via webinars. And I'll talk about an example a bit later on as well. This is my business, uh, Twin Life Marketing. Uh, Melinda gave you a really good introduction. Um, 
yes, we do strategic leadership and marketing for businesses where we not just uplift the business, but also absolutely make sure that we uplift the people. So we don't just develop strategy, but we really help companies drive outcomes because that's really important. And then obviously what makes me most excited is we empower teams. Um, and that's what I'm trying to do today. I'm trying to give you tools and information that you can use in your business tomorrow. So last week we spoke about the digital transformation and last week we spoke about different consumer trends that are being heightened at the moment because of COVID. These trends are not new, but they are heightened. And I just want to talk to you about technology. So Singularity U, um, basically said that technology has changed as much between 2000 and 2015 as it has between 1900 and 2000. And once again, technology is predicted to change the same phase again between 2016 and 2022. So we're right in the middle of that. So it goes faster and faster. So we need to kind of keep up with it or benefit from it. So let me share some stats with you. All the stats, most of the stats I'm using today come from a source called Hootsuite. And Hootsuite is this amazing research company that shares online websites, social media stats on, 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 online. And they research the whole wide world. So if there's anyone online that wants to know anything from a different country in the world, go online and you can find it on the Hootsuite. I'll be sharing stats from Australia with you today. And these are the latest stats, because this is the report from January 2020, where they checked all of 2019. So if we look at the total population of Australia, we've got just over 25 million people and 86% of us live in metropolitan areas. If you look at how many mobile phone connections we have, we have actually more than we have people. And the way to explain that is that a lot of people have maybe two mobile phones, one for work, one for home use. If you look at the number of internet users, we are at 88% penetration, which is very high. Um, and then if you look at the number of people that are active on social media, it's 18 million, so it's 71% penetration. It's very, very high. The other thing I want to share with you, and I was actually quite surprised by this, is the e-commerce spend by category in 2019 in US dollars. So in 2019 in Australia, people spent almost $20 billion on e-commerce in travel, which includes accommodation. Now that is absolutely massive. Um, so if you look at what are the activities that people are doing? So 84% of people in the previous month searched online for a product or a service to buy. And this is absolutely where you can benefit because these people might not necessarily buy online, but this is the people that are searching. So this is an opportunity for you to share your knowledge, to start building up those relationships. Um, really good opportunity. 76% of those people went to an online store. Um, the other thing I want to mention about that, last week I spoke about the customer journey and the more emotional a product is and the higher value a product is, the more complicated the customer journey is and the more important it is to have human contact and have advice. So it's very easy to buy you know, a product that is very common for a very low price in an online store. So that's where your expertise comes in. And then it's interesting to see that um, there was a split about how people buy online. Do they buy via a computer or do they buy via a mobile device? So 47% used um, desktops and 33% used the mobile device. The reason why I'm pointing that out is that the rise of mobile is massive, which means that the way we communicate has to change. It has to be suitable for mobile, which means simpler, shorter, sharper. And I'll come back to that a bit later. Here are some stats from the, uh, from the Australian Consumer Sentiment Report from April this year. And uh, 
it just shows that one in three Australians are expected to increase the digital purchases even post COVID-19 and travel is in the top 10 categories with higher dig digital purchase power post COVID-19. So once again, use that opportunity, try to form a relationship, try to position yourself with this audience as an expert. And we'll talk about this more in detail in the workshop next week. So this is a photo of Joanne and I, and Joanne was my general manager in Twin Life Marketing for seven years, and she also worked for Qantas for 13 years. And she was in the team that originally developed the online booking engine. And she always tells this story. When she originally started working for Qantas, she was in online sales. And she had to go through a training process of six weeks to learn how to make a flight booking for a travel agent. However, when they were starting to build the online booking engine, they had to make sure that this process was put into a very simple process that was easy to use by the user who doesn't know anything about how to book. So this brings me to the core of any digital strategy. It has to be easy and relevant for the user, whether it is searching for information or whether it's booking online. So the user experience has to be a good one. Let me go back to basics. I just want to run past you my definition of marketing because there's a lot of confusion out there. So this is my definition of marketing that was valid 20 years ago, it's valid today, and it will be valid in 20 years time, no matter what is changing in the digital marketing world. Just keep this in the back of your minds. So marketing is really understanding as good as you can what your ideal customers, and I say ideal customers because not everybody can be our customers, but what your ideal customers really need and want and what they value. And then obviously you want to translate that into profitability for your business. And then the second part of marketing, which is often referred to as marketing communication, is making sure that once you know who your ideal customers are and what they need and want and value, delivering the right message to the right target market where your ideal customers are via the right channels at the right time. So what is digital marketing? Digital marketing is simply using online channels to reach and engage, I say your audience, which is your ideal target market and amplify your messages. In the example I gave about, you know, the, the travel website that we built while we were traveling the world, it was amplified because people were sharing it. So online channels can be websites, email, search engines, social media, private messaging. And we'll dive a bit deeper into all of that. But let's look at what is digital marketing. Well, first of all, that's why I actually really love it. It's much more cost effective than traditional marketing. It's great, it gives smaller businesses an opportunity to, to, to be out there, to talk to customers. The speed to market can be instant, it's fast. You know, we don't need to print, very, very good. And the other thing that's great is that we can measure and we can basically see what's going on. And testing and measuring is really important, whether you do digital marketing or any marketing. So that's really great. Last week I spoke about Bruce Poontip, the founder of G Adventures. And you know, he created this ebook unlearn the year the earth stood still about travel post the pandemic and who would have thought that we would ever be able to write a book publish a book and distribute a book in a matter of weeks or days he did this during this pandemic and that's what digital marketing is giving people the opportunity to do but beware digital marketing it can be a challenge to stay on top 
of all the changes in digital marketing because it's constantly evolving. And as technology is evolving faster, this is evolving faster as well. It can be very hard to cut through. It's noisy. There's a lot going on. People are bombarded with messages. How do you make sure you stand out in the crowd? Again, we'll talk about that next week. And it can be overwhelming because if people start to respond, you've got to be there to reply. Who remembers this? April 2017, this was worldwide news, went completely viral. In the United States, a passenger was dragged off a United Airlines flight. If you Google it today, the internet is still bombarded. This is how things go viral. But what's really, I think what's really cool about this, not this, but what a competitor has done. So Southwest Airlines jumped on this straight away with a lot of humor. And I love this, you know, they came back and said, we beat our competitors, not you. Don't get dragged by overpriced flights. We love our passengers, book with us today. So that's just a really great example of how you can instantly, you know, create a lot of goodwill online as well. One more thing I want to um, focus on before we go into the framework is online privacy and well-being. And this is really, really interesting. And for me personally, this is really important because the first value of Twin Life Marketing, <clears throat> sorry, is, <clears throat> sorry, it's truthful. It's not only how we behave, but it's also how we market and how I believe marketing can only be successful. Now, if you look at these statistics, there is 62% of the internet users between the ages of 16 and 64 are concerned about what is real news and what is fake news on the internet. It's a very high percentage. The other thing is, that 63% of people are concerned what companies are doing with their personal data. So again, be aware of that. And if you get personal data from your travelers, from your customers, please, please, please be very careful with that. And the other trend that I actually in agreement with is that 46% of consumers are using some form of ad blocking tool. Now, what does this mean? You know how nowadays when you um, go to an online shop and you, 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 you wanna buy something and you maybe not even buying it. And then when you go online again, all the ads keep following you. And now it's even starting on Facebook. You get all these ads coming up from those companies. That is remarketing and retargeting. It's a Google advertising tool. And 46% of consumers are not really enjoying it. So it's really important to realize what consumers are willing to accept and what they're not willing to accept. So my message to you is when you do something, do it well, do it truthful and be very much respectful. So let's go into our framework. And the framework I'm sharing with you today is a framework that you can keep using every time you want to do a campaign, a communication, a marketing something, please work through these four steps and ask yourselves the questions, why, who, where, and what? So the first question we obviously want to ask ourselves is why? Why are we doing this? So my recommendation is to always start with the end in mind. And, you know, don't do it because, oh, this worked really well for another business might not work so well for your business. Every business is unique. Every market is unique. The salesperson told me I had to do it or otherwise. I call this the yellow pages syndrome. Don't know if any of you know, but uh, oh, we're doing yellow pages ads before. But by the time that the yellow pages was an old marketing tool, the salespeople became more and more aggressive and they were telling companies, if you don't do it, your company might not be there anymore. That's what's happening with some of the digital tools at the moment. 
Um, so really make sure that you don't just follow or what a salesperson is telling you. And don't even do everything that everyone else is doing. Oh, all our competitors are doing it, so I should be doing it. Again, make sure you run your own race. You do it because it fits within the direction that you want to go with your business. It fits within your why. It fits within your customer journey. And also, your target market will benefit from that. Your customers will benefit from that. It fits with what, with what they want and need and value. And thirdly, there is real value in zigging when other people are zagging. So doing something completely different. Give you a very quick example. At the moment, some of our clients in very different industries and travel are getting a lot of traction with, um, with direct mail letters and with handwritten postcards because nobody's doing it anymore and it's special. So always ask yourself, is there a better way to achieve the same outcome when you're thinking about your objectives? So let me talk to you about my travel Indochina experience. So I started working with them in 2004. And after I restructured um, the Australian sales and marketing team, they asked me to help them expand globally. So we already had an office in Sydney, um, and then we um, had an office in uh, Ho Chi Minh City in Hanoi, in Vietnam, and we had one in Cambodia and in Laos. Um, in 2004, search engine optimization, so the free search on Google, and search engine marketing, which is Google AdWords, was relatively new. And we were one of the first travel companies that jumped onto that. So while most travel companies were still spending heavily in newspaper advertising, I diverted my budget to search engine optimization and search engine marketing. I can tell you my budget was extremely small, especially in the beginning days, and I got amazing outcomes. Four years later though, when a lot more companies had caught on, my budget was much higher and my outcomes were much lower. However, what we were able to do, especially in the first two years, we were able to test markets and we were able to test and see whether it was worth it setting up an office. So we set up websites in the UK, in the US, in New Zealand and in Canada. And we then made the decision to open up offices in the UK and in North America and decided to service the New Zealand market from Australia and to service the Canadian market purely online and also from the US. So obviously this strategy wouldn't work today, but at that time it worked really well because we were zigging while everyone else was zagging. Now, a tool that you can use and that I touched on last week that will help you decide what to do is your customer journey. So what I've done, I've actually simplified the customer journey for today and I've put it into three stages and I'll be using your, this customer journey framework in every step that we go through. So the first stage is awareness to consideration where people don't know you yet, they need to get to know you and then you know, they need to kind of give you permission to communicate. Stage two is where they are considering and you want to convert them to becoming a customer. And then there is a stage three. It's when they are a customer, but you want to make sure they are loyal. And you also want to make sure that they are a raving fan. So obviously, your first stage is where you bring new people on the journey. And how can you measure that? You know, what metrics can we put in? Obviously, we need to make sure that people understand or know your brand, which is called brand awareness. Brand awareness is very hard to measure. That's why I've put it in italics. But what you can measure is the number of new ideal people that come into my database. That's absolutely easy to track. Then from consideration where you turn your interested people into active customers. The metrics that you can use and very valuable for this are your conversion rates, your conversion time, 
and your average value per customer. And then your stage three is where you turn customers into fans. And that's where you can track your number of repeat customers, your number of referrals, and things like the lifetime value of a customer. So this you do before you even start doing a campaign. That's your objectives. That's your why. So the questions you ask yourself can be, what do we want to achieve? Why are we doing this? How are we going to measure results? And what are the metrics that we're gonna track and measure? So that's your first step. That's your objectives. The second step is our audience. And our audience are the people, hopefully our ideal target market, that will consume and engage with our content. And your audience is at the core of your digital strategy. You ask yourself the following about your audience. Who are they? Are they businesses? Are they consumers? If they are consumers, what's, what's their age? What's their gender? What's their income, occupation, geography? Um, but you also ask, what, they, what do they need? Um, what do they want? What do they value? Um, what is of interest to them? And how do they consume information? You know, do they like to read articles? Do they like to watch movies? Do they like to listen to podcasts? Or, you know, do they like to view beautiful images? Um, the better you understand your audience, the better you can serve them. So this is where customer feedback comes in and is so extremely valuable. You know, in the previous, um, strategy workshop, we spoke about the value of relationships and the value of a two-way engaging relationship. So there is so much value in asking your target market for feedback. Yes, you can do that online. You can do that face-to-face. -face. It's something that I would recommend um, is like something that you do regularly in your business. It's not just about statistics, but it's also about really figuring out what are the personal preferences of each individual in your target market. Because I can tell you that is where the companies that are using successfully digitally marketing is really heading. Companies that are really focusing on building up those one-on-one -on -one relationships and being very relevant and knowing what their needs and wants are will be the ones that benefit the most from social and from digital marketing. So ask for feedback. And then these are some social media audience uh, stats that I wanted to share with you. And I should rephrase that actually. This is the audience on Facebook, Instagram and Facebook Messenger, which is actually owned by the same company, all, all owned by Facebook. Um, and what we see here is that the biggest percentage of people, you know, on, on social from their target market is between the 25 and the 44. However, the 65 plus and, you know, the 13 to 17 are also on there. What I find interesting, though, is that in the older demographics, the percentage female becomes higher. So it's just an interesting thing to look at. So looking at your customer journey, make sure that in stage one, two, and three, you have a two-way engaging relationship with a feedback loop. In stage one, you wanna turn them from a suspect, someone who is an ideal person, but hasn't given you permission to communicate yet, to a prospect, which is someone who says, yes, happy to communicate, but I'm not ready to buy yet. In the stage two, you want to convert them to a customer. And in stage three, you want to convert them from a customer to repeat customer, and then obviously to someone who keeps referring you. So the questions you can ask about your audience is, who is our ideal customer? Who is part of our audience? What does the audience need, want, value? How do this, these people consume information? 
And how can we make sure that we can get continuous feedback and really build up that two-way engaging relationship? So that's the who. Let's look at the where, the channels. Now, this is a big, chunky one. This is where we have to pick which channels we're going to use to communicate with our audience. And channels can be anything from, you know, websites, email, search, social, private messaging. Or in, uh, another way to look at it is categorize them in owned, paid, or earned. And I'll come back to that. One thing to remember though with channels is that channels will come and go and they will change over time. The effectiveness will change. You know, going back to the Travel Indo China example, nowadays I hardly ever recommend someone to do Google AdWords or, you know, search engine optimization might be okay. And it, it, it works when you're in a very niche, niche um, uh, space. But when you're in something as generic as travel, there's far too much competition, which means the prices have been driven up. Um, so I'm going to take you through the channels. I've just picked out the main digital channels. There's obviously plenty more, but I think this is absolutely enough to have a look at. What's really important is that every digital channel, whatever you use, has to go back to your website. That's your main core, really, really important. So let's look at the search channels. These are the two search channels. Search channels are based on keywords. They are instigated by what the person is looking for. Now there is confusion out there, and some people disagree with me that you, whether YouTube is a social channel or a search channel, now, first of all, on YouTube, you search via keywords. Um, and secondly, I don't know if you know, but in um, November 2006, Google bought YouTube for 1.65 billion US dollars. So these are your search channels. And um, I'm gonna give you an example of um, one of our clients who was doing this but it wasn't working for them because what we are lacking in the search channels, we don't know who is behind the keywords. So we've got an engineering client and um, family business that we've been working with for over 11 years now. And they do spray nozzles and a whole lot of other solutions in the cleaning space, health and safety uh, space and dust suppression, of course, a whole lot of different industries. One of the products that they have is a hose reel. So when we started working with them 11 years ago, they had an SEO campaign running. And the SEO company was very proudly presenting the huge amount of traffic they were bringing to the website for host reels. And when I started looking a bit deeper, I realized that our sales for host, host reels wasn't that flash at the time. And then I looked a bit deeper and I realized that there were no conversions on the website for host reel. And I went, you know what? There's a lot of search volume for host wheels and we're driving a lot of people, but I am wondering if these are all consumers who are looking for host wheel for their garden. And yes, that was indeed true. So what we did is we changed it to industrial host wheels so that we at least made sure that the people that were looking for, our, for us were not consumers. So that can be the downside when you're working with those search channels. So then we have the social channels. And again, I've just put down the main ones. And you know, the biggest one by far is Facebook. 71% of the Australian population is active on it. It's 15 million people in Australia. Then we've got Twitter, 30%. Um, we've got Snapchat, 32%. And Snapchat is very interesting. Snapchat is mainly a channel for young people who don't want to share their stories on Facebook where their parents are sitting at. So it's an interesting channel because it's a channel that the younger generation is using. So don't know how relevant it is for you guys in the travel industry, but it's, um, I still have to see what's happening there. And um, we've got Instagram, 
9.7 million. Um, Instagram is all about images, uh, beautiful images. Um, it's connected to Facebook. I think it works well for travel, especially if you're connected to Facebook. And then we obviously have LinkedIn, which is our, call it our resume site, our business to business network with 11 million users on there. Um, so this, these are the channels, the main channels. There's obviously more. Um, so if you look at the engagement rates or which channels have been used over the past month, the story is a tiny bit different. So they put YouTube on top at 80%, um, but they also put Facebook there, 80%, then Facebook Messenger, Instagram and WhatsApp is very high up there. If you look at LinkedIn, it's much lower. Although they had 11 million people as an audience, the, the, the times that people actively use it is a lot less. And that is simply because people are going to Facebook maybe daily, maybe once every two, three days, maybe once a week, whereas people will use LinkedIn less frequently. Now, I really believe that although you might be marketing to consumers, if you're not business to business and you're in travel, I still believe that there's a great opportunity for you in LinkedIn. And the reason why I'm saying that is because why not zig if orders are zagging? There's not a lot of travel companies that are active on LinkedIn. The other thing is that LinkedIn has gone a little bit more towards Facebook feeds especially during this pandemic, and it started already before, people are starting to share more personal stories on LinkedIn. It's business to business, but we also want to show our human side, which we talked about last time. And the other thing is, depending on your target market, you know, if you market, for example, to couples, uh, honeymooners, families, these people um, have careers as well. Um, so there might be a really great way to you know, get connected with them there as well and, you know, cross-refer, cross-promote. So, um, you know, I would go, if I had my travel company, I would definitely use Facebook, Instagram is connected, and um, I would use LinkedIn. But look at all these channels, the search channels and also the social channels. They are all paid channels. So these companies that are behind these channels, their sole purpose is to make money, to make profit. Their sole purpose is to sell advertising. So that's what I call the paid, paid um, online game. And um, there's one element in there that I haven't touched on, and that is online PR. Now, online PR can be somewhat free. And it's very similar to offline PR. It's where you write a great story and one of the magazines picks it up. This is where an online magazine or an online website will pick it up. The difference though is that the real value in online PR is that you get a link back to your website. And the more link backs that you have to your website, the more valuable your website will become. Now, what I always recommend to my clients is to basically use the online editors, journalists, and bloggers as a part of your audience. Make them part of your database. Keep them informed of what you're doing. Treat them as very special people in your audience. Um, so that's your paid channels. The other thing I quickly want to show you is, and this came out of the Hootsuite um, research as well, the top five most visited websites in Australia in 2019. You know, it is a race against Google, against Facebook. Google.com, number one. YouTube.com, number two. Facebook.com, number three. Google.com.au, number four. But interestingly enough, Wikipedia, number five. So let's look at your own channels because these to me are really, really critical. These are the channels that are yours. These are the channels that you're not sharing with anyone. So your website, really, really important. Whenever you do an email, make sure you send people to your website. But your database to me is 
really, really key because that data is yours. I am going to share an example with you from outside the, outside the travel industry. And about five years ago, we worked for a company called Edenville and they do alcohol removed wines. Um, and you can buy them at Coles and at Woolworths. They're actually quite nice. Um, and we helped this company transform to digital because all they had been doing until then was purely um, traditional marketing. They were doing a lot of radio advertising, they were doing billboards, they were doing um, cinema advertising. And as you can imagine, that is very, very expensive. Now their target market um, is pregnant ladies and also young moms. So for us, it was very clear, great, we know where to find them. We can find them on Facebook because that's where they hang out and that's where we can find their demographics. We knew that search wasn't an option for this. So what we did is we created a page on Facebook, but we were very new. This company had never done Facebook, not a Facebook page, whatever. But what we did is we linked it back to a competition page on their website. And what we had was we had a competition running for eight weeks where people could fill in their name and their details and they could win a holiday. What we then did, because we didn't have a lot of exposure on Facebook, was thinking about who can we connect with on Facebook so that we can drive traffic to our page on Facebook and then obviously to our website. And we knew that there were a whole lot of communities of mothers out there. And there was one, and I can't remember the name, that had about 20,000 members. And they were giving us advertising opportunities. And the amount of money that we had to spend for this advertising opportunity was relatively low um, because it's digital. So we advertised there. We connected with a whole lot of mums groups. And the other thing we did is we researched all the mummy bloggers because there were a whole lot of mothers who had become bloggers and they were testing and trialing all these new products. So what we did is we organized a lunch at Cafe Sydney where we served all the Edenvale wines with the courses. And um, basically what came out of that was a lot of free PR, which then obviously drove people to the Facebook page, which then drove people to our website, which then drove people into our database. So after eight weeks, we not only increased sales you know, in stores by 20%, but we also build up a database of 10,000 ideal customers that all of a sudden had given them permission to communicate and they could use um, to start building a relationship with. And what, what, what happens then? Marketing becomes very cost effective. So these are your channels. You've got owned, you've got paid, and you've got earned. So owned are your web properties, your website, your email database. And you know, I, I still question your social media channels. Are they really yours? Yes, you own them. No, you don't own them because they are proprietary of you know, the platform. And if they decide to change rules tomorrow, which has happened in the past, you're gone. So always make sure that you bring them back to your own properties. There's obviously paid advertising, paid promotion. The reason why you do paid promotion, and I'm not saying you have to do this, but the only reason you do it is because you want instant results, you want quick results, or because you want to get to really understand your audience and you really want to get the data. So paid promotion is anything from, you know, the pay-per-click, which is your Google AdWords, or they call it search engine marketing, which is also your retargeting and your remarketing. It could be any ads you do on social media. It could be display ads you do. It could be paid content. It could be paying influencers. Um, but where the real value is, is in your earned, where people start sharing you, they mention you, they repost, and reviews, reviews are extremely valuable. I'm sure you all understand the value of TripAdvisor. How many travelers are using that nowadays? 
So reviews, think about this, something for your business as well. How can you get more reviews online and where can you get them? You can get them on Google, Google Places, you can get them on Facebook, you can get them on LinkedIn. Think about how you can get more reviews. So the core where you use owned, paid and earned media to gain visibility and you engage with your audience. You know, that's the core. And you don't need to do them all. You just decide what your budget is, what your time frame is. But definitely focus on your own. Really, really important. So um, the customer journey, as I mentioned, a really focused approach. Really focused. Do less and do it well. You know, in the first stage, you might decide to do some paid but you definitely want to focus on your own and you want, to own, you want to focus on your own. In stage two, when people have given you permission to communicate, don't waste your money or your time on paid advertising. Focus on owned and earned. And in stage three, when they are already customers, absolutely again, focus on owned and earned. So questions to ask yourself about channels is, do we need to make improvements to our own channels? Always the first question to ask, is there anything we need to improve on our website, in our email, in our database? Um, and again, we'll talk about that next week in brands because out of that will, might, might come improvements that you can use. And what channels does our audience use? No need to use a channel if your audience isn't on there. And on what channels will we focus on? We can't do everything. Focus, keep it simple. And then how can we get more reviews? Um, something really simple. So the last part of the framework is our content. And content is about two things. It's about our form of communication. You know, as I spoke to you about before, is it text, is it images, is it video, is it podcast? You know, what does our audience prefer? And what is also most suitable to our product or service? Now, obviously, travel is very emotional and we have beautiful images and videos. So I think that's a really great way to get emotion across. Um, but, you know, there's other ways to communicate as well. So I'll give you a few principles about content creation. Always ask yourself, is it relevant? Is it relevant to my target market? Is it valuable to them? How is this going to serve them? The other thing that we spoke about last week is the power of storytelling. Tell stories, educate, you know, don't go selling, just tell stories, much more powerful. Obviously, it's sometimes difficult to create content from scratch. It can be a lot of time. It can sometimes be a lot of money as well. But there's so much great information already out there on the internet. Curate that information and put your own spiel onto it. That's what I've done today with the statistics. I haven't created them, I've used them, but I'm putting my own spiel onto it. Be very consistent and repeat, repeat, repeat. You know, it takes seven times before a message sticks. So we forget about a company or a brand within six weeks if we haven't heard, about, heard from them. So make sure that your message is consistent and this repetition. And then last but not least, keep it short and keep it sharp, especially with more mobile use. People are not reading anymore. Keep it very short and keep it sharp. As I mentioned to you in the beginning, um, I've recently started working with Luxperia in Vietnam. And um, they've again given me permission to uh, share another um, example with you guys. And this is an example about um, outbound marketing. So Luxperia, um, yes, it's a destination management company that obviously markets to travel agents and tour operators in Australia, but it's also a company that arranges travel for um, people within Vietnam. I call it high net worth individuals. It's the expat community and also the locals. And this brand, we only officially launched this brand in April. Right? You think you must be crazy to launch a brand in, you know, during a pandemic. But I actually thought it was a really good time because we're zigging when everyone else is zagging. And we did this on a shoestring budget, absolutely shoestring. So what we did is we came up with a Dream Now Travel Tomorrow campaign, which we launched on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. 
and we shared beautiful images and just to inspire and we did a little bit of an education you know this is who a vietnam's formal imperial capital and we, we shared a whole lot of photos um about asian destinations and that's how we basically got people to see the brand name and what we did simultaneously we set up a travel club page on facebook and we got people to join so within a couple of weeks we had 400 people on that page and what we then started to do because vietnam you know is okay there's no COVID anymore they've been able to travel inside the country for quite a few weeks now so as soon as things opened up we had daily deals unlocked where we had staycations you know stay in a really beautiful hotel in your own city we jumped onto the trend of uh you know healing and being in nature so you know we're promoting at the moment a forest healing experience um which is a very cool one i wish i could go but it's in july so that's what we're doing at the moment they're not hard selling however they can inspire people and we're getting people who are traveling and who are booking these things so that's stage two of your customer journey and then the last step of the customer journey is and we've done this all very quickly we've launched luxperia black label and this is an exclusive travel society so what we're doing the people that are traveling at the moment with us the vietnamese people or the expats in vietnam are our ideal customers and when they get home they receive a letter nothing digital they receive a letter in the post which is signed by lin lee who is the founder of luxperia it welcomes them home and it invites them to become part of luxperia black which give them gives them rewards so what we're doing is we're surprising them we're delighting them and we're getting really good feedback on this so when you look at your customer journey stage one that's where you need to inspire you know it's where people need to get to know you and you do that by telling stories by educating your second step it's where you want to engage with them you know again stories education but that's also where you want people to take action and where your offer comes in and then in the last step you want to reward them so you again you want to share stories maybe their stories can become part of your stories you want to educate them and um, you obviously want to make them feel special because you want to create that loyalty so surprise and delight them so think about your content what are we going to do you know will we create text images, video or podcast, or what's most relevant to our audience? And how can we use stories and educate the markets? And what content should we have at each stage of the customer journey? So that's your digital framework. Really important when you go through this, and this is one of the exciting things about digital is that you can test, measure and optimize. If you are not sure, test it in a very small area. At the moment, we are doing a service campaign for one of our customers in a very different space in the food industry, food equipment industry. And we are testing this in the Northern Territory in a very small, small market, because we wanna know how the, how the market is going and how the reactions are and to see if we need to fix something up before we go out to the bigger market, Australia wide. So, test it and measure it and optimize it and always ask yourself how can i improve it next time so what to do next from here so obviously i hope you will use your digital marketing framework to either optimize what you're doing at the moment uh, or even start new activities if this is all quite new to you and you know if it's new or if you're improving just start small Focus on one thing and do it well before you move on to the next thing. If you are on LinkedIn or want to get on LinkedIn, please connect with me. Um, you can find my name. Um, there's nobody else with my name and surname. And <clears throat> if you enjoyed this webinar, I would really appreciate it if you could leave me a short five-star Google review. Um, that would really help my business um, because reviews are really important to us as well. So you just type in Google Twin Life Marketing Sydney, and then on the right-hand side, you see Google Places come up, 
and if, if you can say write a review so i would really appreciate that um, and obviously we have another workshop next week which is the third one in the series of three which is the brand workshop so um yeah sign up for that one if you want to learn a bit more i'm going to hand back to to joe for to see if there's any questions Can't hear you. Joe, I can't hear you. So sorry, everyone. Can't hear you, Joe. <laughs> I hope no you can problem. hear me now. <laughs> I was just thank you, thanking you very much, Sonia. Um, now, we, ha we do have uh, a couple of questions, and in fact, I'm getting inundated with um, lots of thank yous. So thanks so much for um, the comments, everyone. Uh, Sonia would really appreciate if you did take the time to do a review, and also if you could complete the webinar survey that we'll send out to you after this webinar. That's really helpful for us. We do have a couple of questions, so, so I'm just going to... Oh. Pardon, Mel? So I was just going to add to that. Everybody, when you um, fill out the survey, and that would be great, I um, would love to um, hear about what other sort of webinars you might like um, to help you through this, I suppose, hibernation period. Um, what sort of webinars can we run in the same sort of area as this or anything that you feel is going to help your businesses while you're trying to go through recovery? So um, AFTER is here for you, but, you know, I would love to have some suggestions if some of you um, have some hot ideas about sort of the webinars we could run for you. Thanks, Joe. sorry. No, no, perfect. Thanks, Mel. Mel is our um, Head of After Education and Training and she is the guru running around in the background making sure that the webinars we delivered to you are really relevant. Um, so yeah, definitely feed those comments through. Now you're going to see me turn my head over here because this is my second screen so that I can see some of the questions. So Sonia, Karen has asked a question around what's the best way to keep up posting across all these social media channels? Can you recommend some way of sharing just one post across all the channels? Um, absolutely. Make it simple for yourself. Um, use the same content across all the channels. Um, because people that will engage with you, say on LinkedIn, might not necessarily engage with you on Facebook. So there's a couple of ways you can do it. You can simply just copy the paste. You can Facebook and Instagram are linked anyway, so you can do that. And then you can copy and paste it into LinkedIn. However, there are also tools, oh, and sorry, the, uh, the names just, I don't have them on the top of my head, but there are tools that you can use that basically post to all the channels that you select straight away. So yes, absolutely don't think about changing it uh, for the different channels. Keep it simple, keep it consistent, saves you time. Uh, at AFTER, we like to use a platform called TweetDeck. That's a really good yeah. way. Yeah, TweetDeck's a good one. Um, and I even know HootSuite, Sonia's a good option as well. And that was the okay. example of stats that you used. Uh, Sonia, we've got a couple of questions around blogs. So firstly, one from Max going, you know, are blogs, blog sites or blogs on your website worth having? Okay. The really great advantage of having a blog on your website is that the content on your website changes. So if you have a blog on your website, I would recommend that on your homepage, you have the latest news so that your homepage refreshes. Because if your homepage regularly refreshes, that means that you're active, which gives you higher ranking in Google. The other reason why blog sites could be really relevant is the content stays there. So if you, for example, are selling, you know, adventure holidays to, you know, South America and, you know, you, you, you create blog posts around certain keywords that will drive certain traffic potentially to your blog pages and then people might look around at other pages. So, yes, I really believe in blog pages. The way that I've done it for my business um, because obviously I'm a very small business as well and don't have that much time to market, but about 
six years ago, I decided to write one blog post per month because my market is business to business. I use that blog post on my site. It's on my homepage. I use that for my email database. I also use that in all my social media channels, which means that in my case, which is business to business, I, with that one piece of marketing activity, I cover all my channels. And um, so, yes, absolutely. Um, the more content on your website, the better. And Sonia, a question from Marion wondering, how do you go about getting these blogs noticed? Of course, when people go to your website, they would be able to uh, read it and see it. But anyway, is yeah. getting directing traffic to them? Yes. So obviously, um, make sure that you send it out to your database as well so that you, you know, can track which people are coming, coming there. The other really good thing is when you are curating content, um, and using information that might be on other websites, put links in there to other websites. But also you might be um, giving your content to other websites. So that's what, that's what I was talking about with the online PR. So for um, some of our customers, when we write blog posts that go onto our website, we turn them into an online media release. So they will go onto online platforms or online magazines, which will then drive traffic back to their website. Um, yeah, and the other, the other thing to do is put it on your social media channels because um, mm. that's obviously where people hopefully share it and mention it. Um, you know, tag other people in it. Uh, tag, if, it, if it's a, a post about something that, you know, uh, someone else you work together with, try to find other communities online that might have similar target markets. And um, maybe if you are a shop in a certain area, try to do something with the local businesses around you that targets your certain area, local area. So just try to be a little bit creative around that. Yeah, definitely. And Sonia spoke about your database is something that you own. So definitely use that channel and push your blogs out yeah. through your EDMs. Correct. Sonia, we've got a couple of questions, one from Fabian, one from Cassandra, um, and they're both asking, um, you know, how often and how consistently should you be using social? You mean to post? Yeah, as like as how a, frequently would you recommend posting? Yeah, I mean, it's very, very interesting. Um, it depends on your market. It depends whether it's consumer or whether it's business to business. Uh, but obviously, you want to make sure that people don't forget about you. So I would say a minimum of once per week. That, that would be my golden rule. You know, you don't have to go overboard. You don't want to bombard the market. If there is something more that you have to say, yes, do it. But I would say if you can do it once a week to start off with, that's a really good way to do it. So one thing that we do with our clients I don't, that might help for you. We, we, for some of our clients, we do like a, a monthly newsletter where we have two or three articles. So we do the newsletter and then every week in between, we post that article on social. Now, obviously, these companies don't have as many exciting things to talk about as you guys in travel because you've got all these amazing images and, you know, you can tell stories. And so because um, some of our clients are very technical companies, you know, and very different. So um, for you guys, it shouldn't be that difficult. Um, you know, with Luxperia, we did twice a week in the beginning. Um, but yeah, once a week um, minimum, I would say. That's great. And then I've just got a question from Fabian asking about recommending a database. And I think he's meaning a, a database that allow you to do direct marketing, EDMs. At AFTA, we yes. use one called Campaign Monitor that I find really oh, yeah. easy to use. Yep. I know Campaign Monitor. So, Sonia, any yeah. other top of mind that you think of? Yeah, another one that's really um, easy to use and that's actually free is uh, uh, MailChimp. Yeah, MailChimp. It's, it's an email database as well. Um, that's probably the one that I would go to um, as you know a step-in solution. Um, also, if you're looking for a customer relationship management system, a really good one to look at, which is also a, I think there's even a free version, is called Zoho. Oh, yeah. Um, and you, can, you can connect that to MailChimp as well. So, um, how do you spell that? Zoho is Z-O-H-O. Okay, thanks. Yes, you're welcome. 
Perfect. Uh, and then one last question here from Natasha before we wrap up because I know we're over 12 o'clock. Um, Natasha says, hi, Sonia. What's the best way to ask for referrals from existing clients? That's always a tricky that's one. A, you know, that's a really, really good question. Um, very good question. One place you can do it very subtly is put it on your email signature. Say something like, you know, um, the greatest thank you is for us as a referral or is something like that, you know, so it's a one sentence in your email signature. Um, the other thing you can do is um, ask hmm. when you are with your customer on the phone, when you are on the phone or when you are with them face to face and they are telling you what a great experience they have had. Don't say, do you have a referral for me? But do you say, ah, oh, you've had such a great experience with us. Do you maybe have any friends or family members that you think we could help? You know, you, 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 you turn the message around. Um, the other thing you can do is you can do a referral drive campaign. But I would recommend you maybe do that only once or twice per year. You know, it could potentially be, I'm just thinking out loud now, it could potentially be, once the borders open, you go back to your database and say, hey, you know, borders are open. We're here to service you. And we're also here to service your friends and your families. Um, you know, come in, we're organizing something. So um, that's what I would do. Um, you know, there's this whole question about, do you give something for a referral? Um, and I would always say, again, surprise and delight people. So ask for a referral if they do something give them a surprise or delight, something they don't expect because you'll get more referrals from them. Great. Don't, don't, the, don't be afraid to ask. Yeah. And you've got a great opportunity now. You know, you can say, I'm rebuilding my business um, and I want to keep serving you. Is there anyone else you know that I can serve? Yeah, my husband owns a small business and I know he's gotten very good at going um, after someone compliments him on his service he says oh if you really liked it um, would you mind doing a google review or would you mind giving me a good review on on facebook and that's a really subtle way as well to get Correct. your brand in front of your um of their friends and families Correct. Correct. jacinta just shared a really great idea she um once her clients come home from overseas she gives them a welcome home letter uh, with a yep. voucher which can be shared amongst family and friends. So thanks for sharing. Love Jessica. it. Great idea. Love it. Great idea, yeah. Um, just one thing, Marion just wrote in and said that MailerLite is a really good platform for newsletters and okay. campaign monitoring. I haven't heard of that one, but I'll definitely look that up. Oh. So that's MailerLite, as in M-A-I-L-E-R-L-I-T-E. Great. One Thank word. you. Now, I said the last one was the last question, but this will be the last question. Um, Andrew's written <laughs> in, and I re would really like an answer to this. Um, he mentioned that you should, well, you mentioned that um, you should always link back to your website. And if you're just building awareness and not trying to sell a specific product, Andrew would like to know which part of the website site would you recommend linking back to? An educational post. Ah. <laughs> that's where your blog comes in always link don't don't link back to a service page or product page link back to travel stories travel itineraries suddenly don't have to come to people always go to the home page people always go to the about us page link back to your stories mm. Mm. could, could you link back to a page which is all about the team and their passion for travel and their experience At Absolutely. If your story is about your team, which is a great topic to talk about, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll cover that next week when we talk about brand, absolutely link back to your team. If you're proud of your team and it's one of your different shaders, absolutely. Yeah, good one. Yeah, brilliant. All right. Well, we're going to wrap it up there. Sonia, thank you again for sharing your expertise with us. We greatly appreciate the amount of work that you have um, invested in us. Um, so thank you so much and we look forward to uh, our next webinar all about mm. brand next week. Great. Can I just finish Thanks, off Sonia. with one quote? Thank yeah. you. 
I just want to share a quote with you that I think is so relevant and just keep this front of mind, please. You know, good marketing makes the company look smart, but great marketing makes the customer feel smart. That's so, so key. Very clever. I like that. Everyone, quick, write that down. <laughs> it's on the worksheet as well. Uh, the worksheets, everyone, if you didn't have a chance to download them, they're both on the AFTER website and this recording will also be put on the AFTER website by end of day today. Thank you so much for joining us. It was great to have you all. Thank you. Bye, Sonia. Bye, Mel. Bye.